Hello, um, I'm Scott Gentry from Brave New Coin, and I'm here with Norbert from Tokyo FinTech. How are you, Norbert? Very well, Tony. Thank you, Scott. How are you? Good, good. Haven't seen you since back in the Heisei era. Indeed, it's been like before Golden Week. We had a long break. Well, it's a whole new era. Good, <laughs> a whole new era. Good to be back. Um, so today we are with uh, Thomas Glucksman from Diginex, and he is the head of uh, data management solutions. How are you, Thomas? I'm good, thank you. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Norbert. Good to be here on the Tokyo FinTech podcast. Good. Uh, today, so we, we want to kind of get to know you a little bit, learn about uh, Diginex, what you guys are doing. Um, wondering if you wanted to start out, just give us the sort of uh, background of what Diginex is and um, what you guys are up to. Sure. So uh, Diginex is focused on building institutional adoption for both digital assets and blockchain technology. Uh, the company uh, was originally founded a few years ago by former financial services professionals and technology entrepreneurs. Back then, the main focus was on trying to help secure the infrastructure of blockchain um, by operating Ethereum mining facilities. Uh, we then expanded the team to bring on more professionals from both finance and technology. Uh, and then now uh, the two, let's say, main pillars of our business, which we feel to be quite complementary, are financial services and uh, blockchain solutions. Within the financial services business, we're building a, a suite of institutional tools for digital asset management, so an exchange, custody, fund of fund, uh, and liquidity provision. Uh, and then on the blockchain solution side, uh, where I sit, we're working with corporates, governments, NGOs to build blockchain enhanced solutions to tangible problems that exist. Uh, and a core part of that uh, suite of offerings that we provide is data integrity. So mm -hmm. using blockchain to provide that immutable audit trail and secure uh, integrity layer on top of transactions, whether it's uh, exchange of documents, contracts being edited, exchanges of value, so how do you better track people, products, documents, and value? So with respect to that, addressing some specific problems in, in blockchain that you're trying to solve, and you talk about data contracts and management thereof, et cetera, are there some specific product-oriented solutions that you're, that you're looking at? Yeah, so uh, data integrity is, is really the, the core of the um, solutions that we're offering. And, uh, given my, my title as, as Head of Data Management Solutions, that's, that's really the, the, the core focus of, of those offerings. And when we look at, okay, what sort of problems exist where data integrity is an issue? So you've got organizational fraud, mm -hmm. tampering of documents, doctoring of financial statements, which can sometimes be driven by management. Sometimes it's disgruntled employees. Sometimes it's a range of different uh, factors that can result uh, in, in those issues from happening and then that then has quite major consequences for those organizations whether it's the money lost due to fraudulent activity or if it's the uh, the impact of fraud of fines um, and other uh, let's say um, uh, con legal consequences of, of having those illegal activities happening um, whether it's you know, not complying with certain regulations, etc. So addressing fraud is, is a major issue. Um, the other area of integrity or data integrity that we are looking at and spending a lot of resources trying to address is uh, migrant worker or more specifically employment contract integrity. So uh, there are a lot of issues right now that still exist in the world today around protecting the the rights of uh, migrant workers. So sorry to interrupt, but how how in particular would Diginex be able to help solve that particular issue? Yeah, so with respect to migrant worker exploitation, we've partnered uh, with an NGO based in Hong Kong called the Mekong Club, mm -hmm. uh, which is focused uh, primarily on trying to address the issue of human trafficking uh, and trying to increase the transparency and responsibility within supply chains, particularly among manufacturing companies which have operations across Southeast Asia but also other places uh, around the world. 
So what we did with them is we uh, actually created a uh, solution that we've called Emin, which is a play on of the word for migrant in Chinese and I think also in Japanese. Yeah. Um, and it's an app that enables migrant workers to securely record their employment contracts. So for example, if a migrant worker from Bangladesh is being recruited to work in a factory in Malaysia, right now there are a lot of uh, issues with those contracts that they are initially, uh, when they're initially being signed, um, being torn up when they arrive in the, in the country where they're supposed to be working or at the factory or the terms of the contract not being respected by the immediate employer, which would be the factory owner operator. So then the, the company, the global manufacturing brand name, which is actually outsourcing the manufacturing to these companies, um, has uh, very little visibility of what's mm -hmm. going on. And you've seen many cases of, um, of certain labor abuses uh, throughout those manufacturing supply chains, you know, some very famous examples have appeared, you know, going back 20, 30 years. And so companies know that not only is there a reputational fallout of them having uh, irresponsible supply chains or cases of, of worker exploitation, but also it's just better business practice to make sure that your, mm. your workers are having their rights protected. So what we've done with regards to uh, adding a layer of data integrity using blockchain is we create that immutable record of those different touch points or activities. So the point of the, the contract being created, the contract being signed, the contract being exchanged, all of those different touch points with the contract has an immutable record associated with that activity so that if there's any dispute or any challenge to um, the integrity of that original touch point that say the, the contract being signed or the uh, initial employer uh, being able to, to view and interact with that um, contract, there is that reference point on the blockchain which cannot be changed. It's a, a so-called single source of truth that no one single organization or party can have control over. So it's almost like a, a decentralized reference point in a way to the integrity of that contract. On like to, to model contracts and basically keep them, you, you need to obviously associate them with the individual, which brings you then back to a digital ID as the base of all of this, right? Which many people are, are working on essentially. But what's the Diginex approach to kind of digital ID as the foundational piece? Yes, yeah, so the digital ID is a very compelling use case of blockchain technology. Uh, sometimes it's described as a digital federated ID. Uh, there are many global organizations working on this because the reality is to have a so-called federated ID to be recognized by governments, by corporations, as a, from anything from a single sign-on equivalent to something like a Facebook login to actually having a digital ID in the absence of any paper-based document like a passport or national mm -hmm. ID particularly for populations which are at high risk, like refugees. So I think there's many organizations working on that. Where we uh, come in currently is uh, through the, the application we've built, Emin, is um, uh, ro rolling out the ability for the migrant workers to record their ID as well as their contract through the application. Because in some cases what you have is the not only the contracts being um, torn up or abused or not adhered to by the immediate employers, but also their IDs being confiscated or, or held in custody, which means that it's very, very difficult for them to leave those conditions. Hence why those situations are described as modern slavery, because mm -hmm. they're brought over, contracts are not being honored, it's almost like no contract exists whatsoever, they're forced to work, they cannot escape, their IDs are being held hostage. Mm -hmm. Whereas if they had a way for them to to reference and have a, uh, a secure way of being able to share this ID to, to people that are given permission, whether it's the, the government authorities, the employers, and even on the other side for the immediate employers, the government authorities, the, the local uh, labor organizations to have visibility as well through this application. Mm. 
and then the blockchain integrity layer simply serves as that immutable source of truth for that identification document. So what would be the flip side of that? So if you look at it from an inverse, inverse perspective, you've, you're looking to protect the migrant workers from the corporations, which there are many cases to back up your, your comments about yeah. and contracts being ripped up and people taking, being taken advantage of. But there are some cases where the migrant worker him, himself, herself, has bad intentions and wants to use that as a vehicle to to actually migrate to a country of choice, is there some sort of flip side protection for the employer as well? Exactly. So where, what we've done with our data integrity solution, more focused on the corporate side, is trying to address the issue of document fraud. Um, most of the, the, the applications we're, we're seeing for this now with our current clients is on the KYC side. So when you're onboarding a client, uh, if they are submitting a, a fake ID or fake proof of residence documents as part of your onboarding process, there is, again, that immutable record of that exchange of information, that exchange of documents, that if it turns out that is a fraudulent uh, document, at a later stage, there is no disputing that that fraudulent document was submitted. Mm. So it's almost like a disincentive for that to happen. We definitely see adapting that to this uh, EMIN application later on, whereas we would be targeting not only organizations looking to increase the responsibility of their supply chain, but to, to Scott's point, actually protecting them from um, cases where we see in particularly some emerging markets of uh, fake qualifications being submitted. There are you know, many cases, I, I don't want to name particular um, uh, countries um, to, to seem discriminatory, but there are certain places where there is a prevalence of, of fake uh, university degrees mm -hmm. and fake qualifications, fake IDs, especially in the absence of, of an actual real ID. That's why this whole need for a federated digital identity becomes even more um, important and then on top of that, for all of the other, let's say, qualifications, which once you've attained them, don't necessarily expire, for that to be notarized through this immutable uh, ledger, like a blockchain, is also very compelling. And so we see adding all of this into the, the next rollout of, of, of both EMIN and our other data integrity solutions. Mm -hmm. I mean, similar to Scott's question, I was thinking about the, the European refugee crisis and when Germany basically opened the floodgates and left everybody in, right? And clearly there was uh, part of that that ended up in kind of social security abuse, etc. And um, a bit the question of actually having logistically the ability to fingerprint everybody and ID everybody on entry, which was impossible, mm. but even... To, to manage that at a European level to keep track of people who are getting into the country and making sure that they are where they're supposed to be and basically and then have, having been granted residence and not shifting to other maybe more desirable locations uh, seems like a, at the national level even and a use case for this technology. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the, the idea of a, of a national digital identity and perhaps in the future, something that's sorry, recognized on the global level as well. Um, I think we will eventually get to that point of that digital federated identity. Uh, I think the, the, the challenge is, on the, on the one hand, um, being able to ensure your population is, is comfortable with the idea of, uh, of some sort of custodianship of their information if you're giving them sovereignty over their information, I think a lot of people would be on board. But if the government is saying, oh, we, we are actually the custodians of your, of your data, we're just providing a more convenient way for you to exchange that information between mm -hmm. different services. I think depending on the political climate of that, of that country, it, it could go both ways. So um, I think that there, that there is a political challenge for for governments to, to put this into place. But when you look at what initiatives governments already have uh, happening, like in Estonia, you have the, the e-government 
Um, I think here in Japan, um, I mean, what I would really like to see on talking hypothetical uh, for, for a minute is the adaptation of the, the My Number system in Japan, which is essentially almost like this digital, or not necessarily digital, but this, this, this literally number for every member or resident where that is being used as a, as a way to identify them. So well, we have something similar in the U.S. It's called your social security yeah, number, yeah. which that and my student ID from college, I cannot get out of my head. But I do forget combination locks over the years, so go figure. Um, yeah. But just, um, you know, you, you, you've talked also about fraud, and, and there's the, the digital identity, the national identity, and, and all these things, I sometimes wonder, um, are we beyond the preference cascade in the sense that for so long, and particularly in Japan, people have been against turning over personal identity or having identity uh, markings mm. in there. It's almost like you might as well give everybody a DNA, a DNA sample now of some sort, right? To, so that, you know, once, you're, once you appear on a, a voice recognition or, a, or a, a, a video recognition software, they, they pinpointed you exactly to where you are. But at what point do we get beyond the need to... Uh, have a self-sovereign identity system that we willingly exchange to where we're sort of providing them the own means of violating our privacy. Is that something that you've had some expression of concern about? Uh, I, well, I think the, the, the compelling use case for, for blockchain is you can provide that permission layer in terms of the exchange of, of your information and I, and I feel, feel that that is a very um, strong reason why, personally, I feel we will get to a situation where there will be a preference for self-sovereign identity and that you are able to, to provide permission based on your preference to whatever government agency or, or service that you're interacting with. Um, it also reduces the burden of data custody of that organization whether it's the government or the service so i do think that uh over time these federated identity systems that are being developed using uh, various different blockchain technologies will, will become the mainstream way of exchanging ids but like um you know to, to scott's point and also as i mentioned earlier i think it will depend on the specific uh, political environment because you know you have certain governments in the world which would prefer to enforce it on the other way um, so I really think it depends on on the political evolution of, of this idea because the the technology could be used by to both strengthen individual sovereignty over their data but also to strengthen uh, government oversight over an individual's data as well. So, sort of like a social currency. Well, yeah. Chinese social credit scores <laughs> are there already, <laughs> and you've got the facial recognition with ninety nine percent or exceeding that in China as well. So, kind of the, the worst case scenario is upon us. The only thing that's missing is kind of the the digital currency that can be switched on and off depending on how you behave. Right? Okay. So I wanted to ask a, a question sort of about fraud. You've mentioned um, on the fraud side, and I've, um, I, I'm thinking we're getting beyond the point where somebody can fake identities, but it, uh, it would be interesting to see if somebody's eventually going to game the system and in so doing uh, provide a challenge to uh, cancel out that sort of uh, uh, problem as a, as a potential issue that would change the whole system. But, you know, what types of, you know, fraud... Is, is kind of a broad word. It, yeah. can, it can occur in many different ways and cases. And what what do you think the most uh, the biggest challenges are with respect to fraud? And what do you think the the opportunities are with respect to Diginex mm -hmm. in that particular sort of environment? Yeah, I mean the, the reality is blockchain is only going to be able to help address fraud that happens in the digital realm because a lot of fraud still happens with paper documentation or, or 
tampering of physical goods or however else the, um, the fraud may take place. I think that if uh, what, tackling fraud is not going to be solved solely with the use of blockchain technology. I think there are many other technologies that are there to help to prevent and detect fraud using uh, AI-based systems. I think a lot of fraud mitigation actually comes top down from having proper corporate governance, from having a strong internal audit function, but where blockchain could play a role to help assist the internal audit function or to help uh, crystallize those corporate governments, uh, corporate governance rules is by having this immutable audit trail. And I think if internal actors, employees in your organization, management, which and actually in, in many cases of, of fraud tend to be the ones actually committing or instigating these, these fraudulent activities from happening, whether it's illegal payments being siphoned off to personal accounts mm. or tampering with uh, the accounting to, to show an under or over performance of, uh, of the company's finances. Um, but if you have this immutable audit trail for every activity which is deemed an important activity from an exchange of emails to uploading of certain documents, it could be invoices, it could be um, the, the edits that are happening on a particular Excel file, like all of those touch points just to have a record that is in captured and stored somewhere in a mutual ledger so that at a later time you can reference that what is essentially the, the hash value of that document or that uh, all the information around that activity to what currently exists now and see the discrepancies you can actually see if there has been subsequent tampering with that information or if that information was initially fraudulent you can then say well this is where this took place, here's that immutable timestamp. You cannot deny that this happened. Um, so it just adds some additional points, I guess, of evidence. So in a way, I often describe it almost like an insurance type of a product where it's after the fact, after the event has happened, when you're looking back later on to prove that this fraudulent activity took place, you have that immutable audit trail of the fraudulent activity. Um, so that's why I think if the members of an organization know that they are almost being watched in a way, it's a disincentive. This is, this is going to totally remove the industry in college campuses across the United States where people make fake driver's licenses so that they can get into bars <laughs> below 21. You would not have done this. I had an awesome one, I'm telling you. <laughs> yeah. But it was the same background and everybody just stood under it. So anyway, these, these things are going to change. So. Yeah, I mean, I think to a certain extent it anticipated my, my next question, which I want to come back to what you said about my number and kind of the social security number. Yeah. Right? It seems there's, there's a great push in Japan in different areas, and one of them is, for example, healthcare. And so apparently in two or three years, uh, you get a direct reimbursement for kind of your healthcare cost. And then if you attach your medical records to it, they become portable, etc. And yeah. to your point, uh, if you look at the US where you have a prevalent number, uh, right, that hasn't really helped making kind of medical care more efficient. It's still kind of a disaster to, it's a question who owns the medical records, mm -hmm. right? So you as a doctor and then making them portable from one doctor to the next. So as you said, there's a whole infrastructure that would need to be built kind of on the anchor of that um, kind of my number to make all these other things happen and um, what do you see kind of of the, the implementation migration path for that and kind of the time frame that is achievable? I think it's, uh, it's, it's going to take a while because you would need all of the stakeholders to be on board. Uh, you'd need to uh, to migrate the existing way of, of sharing this my number information um, to this, uh, let's say, blockchain-based system of, of exchanging um, personal information, whether it's just the basic information or if you're talking about portability of healthcare data. Um, I think that is a compelling use case, but for the entire healthcare industry in Japan, all of the relevant government departments because the question may be raised, does it end with healthcare data? Do we also include financial data, credit scores, etc.? And then it's, okay, 
it starts looking lo- looking more and more like the the social credit uh, scoring system in, in China. Maybe it won't be similar, but the question is what types of data will be shared, and again, will the the sovereignty over that data stay with the individual, or will it? Uh, or will the, the, the stakeholders, whoever that central stakeholder is, whether it's the, the organization responsible mm-hmm. just, just specifically for exchanging this information, maybe a new one needs to be created, or it's the existing organization that's already managing the, the, the my number um, uh, uh, ID for, for um, residents of, of Japan. I think it's a, it's, it's a you know, very hypothetical. Um, of, of course, I, I think... Uh, there probably would be a preference for individual data sovereignty. Um, but I think in the short term, what could be a more compelling use case in Japan of, of, of blockchain or blockchain-based notarization is replacing the, the hanko or the, the physical stamp uh, that you get in almost any business transaction in Japan from invoices to going to the, the Kuyakcho, the, the local ward, uh, mm. applying for bank accounts. I mean, the fact that you need to carry this physical, uh, I don't know what it's made of, but um, it's... <laughs> yeah. As long as it can make a little yeah, impression. It's, exactly. It's, you know, wood, it's, plastic. It, having some ink and putting on the piece of paper and sometimes waiting with, even within an organization for five people to put their stamp on, on a document for, for even a menial business transaction, uh, transaction to be approved. I think block, blockchain is a, is a great use case. Wasn't there use. something, I don't know if we shared an article about one of the, one of the banks had decided if, after 230 years that they were going to start phasing out the Hong Kong. Yeah, M- MUFJ uh, did this recently. Was it MUFJ M- that M- did that? Entry starting 10th of, 10th of June. Okay. And, and so it's interesting because uh, the past books actually are legal documents as right. well, and so you actually they pay two hundred yen per passbook per year in in fees. And similarly, I've learned that if you if you have physical legal document that gets stamped, right, you pay the stamp duty for legal document. But if you do like DocuSign or any other of these vendor and sign it electronically. You save that as well, so that's the, the operational efficiency, but there's also actually you save some money by going digital. Well, it's like it's like uh, Ross Perot described that giant sucking sound, that entire sort of middle office that's designed for sort of onboarding just gets totally removed. So anything that can accelerate that and uh, make it easier for people to apply for an account so it doesn't take 10 days or something like that or mm-hmm. uh, it gets people into the financial system and perhaps gets the, the banks into offering more diverse financial uh, products whether the ETFs, ETPs mm-hmm. or, or crypto related stuff so yeah. uh, and I find it quite interesting and, and what we've already built is, is, a, is a version of that but in order for that to have the same sort of recognition that something like the, the Hanko or the physical stamp needs, it needs um, industry-wide and government-wide uh, recognition. Mm-hmm. But anyone can notarize a, a document or, or, or some sort of um, uh, information through the blockchain now. I mean, th- that's the beauty of, of blockchain technologies. It's open source. Anyone can, can interact with any of these public uh, protocols or run your own uh, nodes from permission chain. But when it comes to um, how we can start to introduce this concept, having those different touch points being recorded and, and time stamped can almost form as the, the, the digital stamp equivalent of the Hanko. And the way that uh, we are introducing our, our products is, is so you don't need to have that, that physical stamp because you have that reference point. Mm-hmm. And one thing I want to emphasize is Actually, in many of the engagements we have, and I assume it's very similar for other solutions providers, is the, the blockchain element of both the conversation and the actual final solution that we deliver is probably about 10%. The rest of it is actually how do you understand what their problems are? How do you understand the specific processes and how do you build an application that takes that into account? And in many cases, it's not even about okay, the, the main point of this is to, is to add blockchain to this process. It's actually, okay, we're 
looking at uh, improving overall efficiency, sometimes just through a very basic digital transformation process. And then the blockchain integrity layer strengthens that. Um, and I think that's, that's what's interesting about our experience and also um, I think what many other solution providers are seeing. Whereas what I've observed elsewhere in the market is you have companies that build these amazing technology offerings with very over-engineered solutions using smart contracts and you know, new types of protocols and chains, but they're not, in my opinion, really answering the question of what problems is this technology solving um, and, and how can an organization use it. I think sometimes they have ideas of, okay, this is how this could be used, but they don't, they, they, they tell more than they actually listen to to company problems because if you know you go to company say oh we have this great smart contract you can do this and do that and do that with documents it's like well that's great but what's my ROI what's the value add how does it solve a problem I'm having now that's like that's a good use of the technology but does it actually solve my problem today but if when we go in or when a company similar to us go in and say okay well you've had an issue with fraud or is fraud an issue for your organization or are you having challenges with um, the responsibility in your supply chain um, and if the question is yes and it's okay have you thought about this and this and this how are you managing data currently and, and asking those sort of questions um, I think that's where it, it's really important for the, the next step for blockchain I think this whole conversation is around tangible use cases and I really think the tangible use cases stems from addressing specific problems because the last two years has been great companies building fantastic tech but I think one reason why you've seen a lot of uh, media commentators and and uh, people taking quite a negative view of okay blockchain hasn't been widely adapted or you know it's only gaining traction companies are only doing proof of concepts I think the reason why you've seen a lot of that more negative talk about this technology is because um, many of the, the, the companies let's say going out to market weren't thinking about addressing specific problems, adding value to, to organizations, where I think now this is where you're seeing major companies starting to implement the technology. It's okay, I'm solving a problem, whether it's the efficiency of interbank payments with you know the mega banks here in Japan or there is a been a lot of talk in the last couple of days around the utility settlement coin that's addressing a specific problem in the banking industry and I think that's a great initiative and I think we're going to see more of that kind of adoption versus we can do this really cool thing with smart contracts but no government has really put something specific around how do you recognize a smart contract so what do you think the the challenges are you mentioned you mentioned over engineering and and of course we all know that the industry over the past year or two years is has kind of been has opened itself up to criticism on various levels and we've seen some solutions where they design a rocket ship so that you can go down to the store and get a cup of coffee right exactly likewise we've seen you know somebody designing a cup of coffee that they plan to take to the moon and it's just these two solutions are not going to work. Yeah. Uh, what is, um, are you allowed to kind of talk about how Diginex approaches a problem uh, and elaborating on what you were just talking about? Are you focused really trying to, to nail down the simplicity available in the situation? Uh, are, you, are you equipped to, uh, to handle some of the most sophisticated problems? in a simple way or, uh, or if, if sophistication requires a sophisticated solution uh, how do you guys approach this um, internally yeah no, it's a it's a great question uh, what we always start off with is is finding out okay, what are the the problems that the, the company has what specific challenges are you trying to solve it could be issues with fraud it could be the inefficiency of exchanging KYC information it could be trying to prevent issues in their supply chain from a responsible uh, labor perspective. Um, we also have a, um, a way of solving inefficiencies in uh, treasury management systems. Um, and what we do is we, we ask about the problems, we find out what are those problems, what departments does it affect, 
who are the end users, what have been the, the costs of those issues, uh, and then understand the full picture before we, we, we then go back and say, okay, where does blockchain play a role? Is there a need for multiple stakeholders to be able to, to view this, this information? Because if it's just internally within an organization or department, you don't really need the blockchain. Um, actually, you don't need a blockchain. Uh, that's, that's, that's a fact. Whereas if you have multiple stakeholders across, indus across industries or <coughs> different organizations, but within the same, let's say, supply chain, for example, who may not be comfortable with the idea of, of having data being exchanged for a public or decentralized network, in which case uh, there is a need for having a maybe a permission-based protocol. Uh, so we make all those different decisions about the most suitable uh, protocol and also what process and problem, and then we will build uh, an interface around that because blockchain is a very abstract concept. Mm. You know, unless you have a dashboard, a mobile app, or a way to interact, to upload documents, to send information, that's what the users are going to be using. And then we have a way of showing, okay, this is where the information is recorded on, on, the, on the blockchain network. But otherwise, it's a very abstract concept for, for, uh, for organizations to think about. That's, um, that's why I mentioned before, really what we do 90% is understanding the business, providing some recommendations um, on uh, changing um, certain processes or, or adding um, some more efficient ways of exchanging information and then saying, okay, this is where the, the blockchain integrity layer um, play, plays a role. Uh, and then um, building a full application around that and then going for delivery and then seeing how we can add more features over time. So that's, that, that's, been our, uh, that's been our approach and it's been very successful so far and many of the companies and organizations we've spoken with find it quite refreshing that we go in and we ask questions versus say, this is what we can do. Um, and I think that's been a, a very good approach. With, with regards to sophisticated problems and sophisticated solutions, we always try to tackle um, the lowest hanging fruit first as a proof of concept in a, in a sense of being able to convince the organization that there is value there and then later on tackling the, the bigger problems, whether it's on a larger scale. So in the, in the context of our EMIN solution, you know, we start off with one factory we show them that it works, we get feedback, and then we scale up to you know, several, mm -hmm. and then eventually it's all of the factories run by that, uh, or um, uh, under the, uh, the network of a, of a brand organization in, in a country, or across Southeast Asia, or globally. So this is our approach. Um, if with regards to sophistication of data, it, it could be starting off, okay, we just wanna exchange KYC documents. Okay, next step, we want to actually um, have each of the touch points on contracts being signed or edited or whatever being uh, recorded as part of that immutable audit trail. So it, it really depends, but that's, that's the approach we've taken. And from a technology side or from a blockchain side, what we're doing is not very sophisticated in terms of the actual technology. We're just uh, recording touch points to an immutable ledger. Mm -hmm. We're not creating a new cryptocurrency. We're not uh, doing something with a smart contract to aggregate information from an oracle and then automating a process. I think that will come later on. Mm. But I think most organizations right now don't have the appetite to experiment with that. But where we're actually seeing success and traction is with quote unquote classic use case of blockchain, an immutable ledger. Um, so I think that's, that's why our approach so far has been has been successful and I think later on um, there will definitely be a lot more sophistication in terms of the solutions that we're building but for now um, simplicity has been very uh, uh, you know has, has, has helped us a lot. I mean from, from a real practical perspective as far as your role is concerned B2B sales in Japan take notoriously long time and so uh, how do you how do you manage that? How what what's the practical aspect of you going out and basically trying to sell this to Japanese corporations? How ready are they to kind of 
tangibly engage in in these projects and um, what's you i mean i think you shared lots of advice already in terms of how how to sell this but um it's, it's always like a six or nine months mm -hmm. cycle of explaining everything before you actually get to, to yeah. get to do something giggle, giggle, giggle. <laughs> yeah. well i think um uh I think what's been interesting about our experience so far is we've been able to have access to younger technology companies who have strength in either B2C uh, technology services or in another aspect of emerging technology such as IoT. Uh, so we have two partnerships now in Japan, one with a company called Tatru, which is focused on real estate, digital economy, and another um, that we've recently announced called OK Wave, which is the provider of one of Japan's largest, uh, or I think the largest or one of the first FAQ uh, platforms. Mm -hmm. And they've recently made a few investments and uh, acquisitions in, in the blockchain ecosystem and are working quite a lot on research and development. The success we've had with both organizations is that they recognize immediately and they were already internally thinking about how to leverage blockchain and so we came in as a, as a very uh, synergetic partner for them because that's where we specialize in solely um, and even with some you know, language and, and cultural uh, differences between the, the different organizations we've uh, we found a very very uh, positive way of, of working together and, and, and uh, looking at the mutual strengths and, and seeing um, you know how we go from there whereas you know, being very realistic, we we have talked to some very large Japanese companies, and um, I think there is interest. But we also need to be pragmatic ourselves, and you know, there's long sales cycle, and we're also not a brand name Japanese enterprise technology provider. So, who knows? In the future, we may um, have some partnerships with those companies if if they're able to bring us to the table with larger firms. But I definitely think. Um, where we've seen the most success so far is targeting the younger technology companies where we can mutually complement each other. So I think we will, we'd like to continue along that road. Um, and I think later on, um, once we have more traction and, and more examples of, of those sort of relationships, I think the conversations with the large companies will be easier. I definitely agree there's a lot of education that needs to be done. I think um, right now what I observe in Japan is a lot of the emphasis on the education as far as blockchain is concerned is what is it, uh, how does it work, and from the provider's perspective it's this is what our technology can do, whereas I think what's needed is what problems is this solving, and, and, and how does it benefit A, your organization, B, you know, in the context of government, your department, or, you know, and C, even on a, on a national level, how could this benefit companies in Japan, how can this benefit um, J Japan as a whole as, as far as a, as a new technology domain to, to become competitive in. Yeah. I mean, what you described actually sounds pretty positive because it feels to me then that the startup ecosystem in Japan actually works, right? Innovation happens yes. in the small companies that are adopting these new technologies and eventually it will trickle upwards. And is that kind of what, what you see? I, I, I would hope so. I think, um, and we've been um, very fortunate at those companies where we've, we've formed those strategic relationships and, and that we continue to have dialogues with. They're, they're young, but they're also well capitalized and they've recently gone public or they've been public for a few years. So they're not a, um, you know, a five person team, they're a several hundred person company. In Digidex now we're 120 people worldwide, so we're also not a small startup either, even though we are also an equally young company. So I think that's also why we, we share a lot of, um, of, of traits with those, with those partners in Japan. Um, even for myself, even though I'm based here in Tokyo, um, I also deal with, with stakeholders and potential clients and, and partners globally. Um, and it's been interesting to observe uh, different attitudes in different markets and different uh, ways that this technology is gaining adoption in, in, in different ecosystems. So for example, what I find very interesting about Japan is you've got um, you know, this mandate, um, which maybe is not an explicit mandate, but there is a political will to leverage blockchain technology here in Japan. You see that from the regulator side, you see that from the politicians. I think it's an, 
a, a recognition that this technology, um, if leveraged properly by companies here in Japan, could um, position them competitively on a global scale. I think you've also got the mega corporations, the incumbent players, particularly the banks, also doing quite a lot with this technology, which I think when you compare to mega banks in other parts of the world, is not happening as much, with the exception of, of maybe the US um, and, and a couple of European countries. Then you've got, like I said, the young technology firms, which are also experimenting a lot. You have large names as well with their own <coughs> tokens and loyalty programs or setting up exchanges. And I feel that the existing regulation or current regulation that exists has helped to facilitate that and has also helped to, to um, foster interest among individuals, both on the investment side, but also just, okay, what is this technology? Whereas in other markets, I feel you have maybe one or two of those traits, so a lot of interest from government to leverage this technology, or a lot of interest from corporates to um, leverage this technology, but maybe less so on the individual or entrepreneurial side because Bitcoin is not, or cryptocurrency is not um, recognized as a legal means of payment. So whereas it is in Japan, and mm. because you have that, you have that infrastructure that enables an individual consumer or an individual entrepreneur to engage with this ecosystem quite easily. Of course, there's a lot of progress uh, I think a lot of ways that the regulation perhaps needs to catch up with the current state of innovation. But from what I've heard from events I've attended where regulators and politicians have been speaking in Japan, I feel that they are recognizing this and I feel that the outcome will be, will be positive for mega banks, entrepreneurs working in Japan in this space. Um, I think overseas you, you've had a lot of you know, positive developments in, in places such as Singapore, but because in Singapore on, um, on the individual level it's still quite difficult for people to uh, access and, and use um, you know, cryptocurrencies. And I'm not saying that that needs to be in place before you have greater innovation, but on the other side the Singaporean government and large institutions in Singapore have been doing very, very well in terms of pragmatically looking at you know, how, how they can address problems with this technology. So. so thank you very much, Thomas and Norbert. Um, good to see you both and talk to you about uh, Diginex, and we wish you the best of luck for the future. So signing off from Tokyo Opera City and the Diginex office, I'm Scott Gentry from Brave New Coin with... Norbert Genke from Tokyo FinTech. Thank you very much, Thomas. Thank you very much, Bob.